Hi, I'm Angie Kratzer. I'm a high school English teacher and ELA curriculum specialist in North Carolina. Recently, our newly elected Lieutenant Governor set up a task force that creates a pathway for teenagers and their parents to report teachers who try to politically indoctrinate students in their classrooms. And it got me thinking, what's the motive here? What kind of political indoctrination is he talking about? And I started paying more attention to the governors and the state legislatures and the even individual school boards that were starting to do the same kinds of things to the states that were starting to ban certain ideas. And that really concerned me. So I began doing some research. And what I began researching was critical race theory, which is this blanket term that's being used for a wide range of concepts. And I learned a lot doing this research. And one of the major things that I learned is that critical race theory is not what everybody is saying it is. So I thought it would be worth educating the people that I know, particularly the teachers that I know, and the teachers whom I serve as a curriculum specialist and as a curriculum designer to help teachers make their own decisions about how they're going to handle critical race theory. So that's what we're doing today. I'm going to walk through what critical race theory is and isn't with you, and I'm going to keep it as cut and dried as I can. We're going to look at some myths about CRT we're going to look at three big ideas that are associated with it. We're going to look at four criticisms that have really cropped up in the last year. And then we're going to talk about the outcry about it. Where did it come from? What was the root? What are the motives? And where does it seem to be going in 2021? Critical race theory. What is it and why is it such a big deal? Before we get started, I want you to go to AngieCrosser.com forward slash CRT. There's a handout there for you and some additional resources if you would like to have a little bit more information right in front of you before we get started. Here's your anticipation question for our little session today. How is critical race theory like Google Maps? I want you to keep that question in the back of your mind the whole time I'm talking. I'm going to ask you that question at the end today, and I want you to be able to just, for your own self, answer that question. So, myth number one, critical race theory is new. Not in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Critical race theory, in its current form, really started in about 1971. So, how did CRT come about? Here's your history lesson. Hold on. So we had the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s. Then we had the Civil Rights Act. From the Civil Rights Act, we began to see in America institutions start putting things in place to ensure equity and equality for black Americans. So think of things like affirmative action. In response to institutions beginning to do things like that, white Americans began to push back against those steps, saying that they were unfair and discriminatory. The court system gets involved and, in some circumstances, agreed with the people who were pushing back against those steps. Lawyers and scholars started looking at discrimination more broadly. They started looking at what was happening with the pushback, began to see a slowdown of the civil rights movement, that the changes they were hoping to see were not happening as quickly as they had hoped. They even began to see some movement backwards, and they stopped and said, wait a minute, maybe we need to look at this a little bit differently. And they began to look within the legal system at things like history, the narrative, gender, class, 
literary theory, economics, this really wide range of issues and how all of those things apply to racism within the legal system. And they ask themselves two questions. What are the mechanics of racial inequality? And how might the law be imagined to address them? And those two questions and the process of trying to answer those questions came to be known as critical race theory. The first person to really come up with modern critical race theory was a man named Richard Bell. He was a Harvard law professor, the first tenured African-American law professor at Harvard, actually. He's deceased. The other really heavy hitters in critical race theory are all still alive. One of them is Richard Delgado. He teaches civil rights and critical race theory at the University of Alabama School of Law. Patricia Williams, she teaches now at Northeastern University. Mary Matsuda was the first tenured female Asian American law professor in the U.S. She's now at UCLA. Kimberly Crenshaw, she is at UCLA. Charles Lawrence is at the University of Hawaii. And there are a few others, but those are your big major movers and shakers within critical race theory. So how did this concept appear in popular culture? How did it get from law and lawyers and law scholars suddenly into mainstream American media in 2020? So in the summer of 2020, a conservative activist named Christopher Rufo was interviewed on Fox News, and he said critical race theory was being weaponized against the American people in what amounted to a cult indoctrination, and Donald Trump saw the interview. In September of 2020, President Trump banned the teaching of critical race theory and the term white privilege in federal diversity training. He soon after expanded that to any contractors working for the federal government and called it divisive anti-American propaganda. So this is when we really began seeing this in the news. So back to Christopher Rufo. He's now a consultant. He is a documentary filmmaker by trade who has become a consultant who is advising lawmakers and school boards across the country on how to weed out critical race theory and diversity training from the systems within their governments and schools. But here's the problem. He calls all diversity training critical race theory. All right, so bear with me. This is a lot of text, but I want you to bear with me because I want you to understand why we're all of a sudden calling all diversity training critical race theory. This is something that uh, Christopher Rofu tweeted. He said, We have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic, as we have put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category, Rufo wrote. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. And then he was called on that tweet and he doubled down and he said this in an interview. I basically took that body of criticism. I paired it with breaking news stories that were shocking and explicit and horrifying and made it political, he said. Turned it into a salient political issue with a clear villain. So this has been some of the fallout of all of that in 2021 alone. Texas passed a law limiting how K-12 teachers can discuss current events and America's history of racism. 
Oklahoma, Idaho, and Arkansas have banned the teaching of critical race theory in public college classrooms. Republican lawmakers in almost half of the states have proposed legislation to limit the teaching of ideas like racial equity and white privilege. And legislators behind the Idaho law said critical race theory tries to make kids feel bad which demonstrates the misunderstanding of critical race theory. But the thing is, it's just not happening. Critical race theory is a niche field of study. It is not mainstream. It is not taught at the K-12 level. It's taught in law schools. Some graduate education classes will teach it. But that's it. It is not taught in K-12 schools. Myth number two, everyone agrees on the definition of critical race theory. I found a number of definitions and I pulled a few that had some commonalities and I wanted to run some of these by you. Mother Jones Magazine said, a scholarly framework that seeks to understand the role race and racism have played in all aspects of society. Kendall Thomas said, critical race theory is an effort really to move beyond the focus on finding fault by impugning racist motives, racist bias, racist prejudice, racist animus, and hatred to individuals, and looking at the ways in which racial inequality is embedded in structures, in ways of which we are very often unaware. Ibram X. Kendi said, a theory in an intellectual tradition that seeks to attack structural racism. A sentence in Ed Week said, critical race theory is an academic concept that is more than 40 years old. The core idea is that racism is a social construct and that it is not merely the product of individual bias or prejudice, but also something embedded in legal systems and policies. And then here's kind of a longer one. This is from Richard Delgado, who was one of the originators of critical race theory. He said, the critical race theory movement is a collection of activists and scholars engaged in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. The movement considers many of the same issues that conventional civil rights and ethnic studies discourses take up but places them in a broader perspective that includes economics, history, setting, group, and self-interest, and emotions, and the unconscious. Here's myth number three. This is the big myth. Critical race theory focuses on white individuals' prejudices, biases, privilege, etc. Absolutely not. Critical race theory is not about individual prejudice. Put a pin in that. Hold on to it because it's really important and we're going to come back to it. So big idea number one, and critical race theory is a field of study. It doesn't have tenets. It's not a belief system. So we're just going to look at some big ideas associated with it. Big idea number one is that racism is embedded in our systems and policies. It is baked in. For example, racism is baked in to our criminal justice system, health care, education, housing, and banking. Those are systems. So we're not talking about prejudice. We're not talking about the guy down the street who uses the N-word or the guy down the street who is waving a confederate flag we're talking about big behemoth systems big idea number two this one's a little complex so stay with me this one's in parts in any culture the people in power set up the social structures in order to make the society work in america wealthy white people mostly men have set up and run the systems that are in place. You with me so far? All right. So just to reword it a little bit, in any culture, 
somebody's got to make things work so that the culture survives. In this culture, in America, the people who set up the systems that we have in place were mostly rich white men. Nothing to argue about. Well, maybe there is something to argue about. Maybe you disagree with that. Maybe you don't think it's wealthy white men who are in power. So let me try to convince you. This is the current United States Senate. Notice anything? This is the current United States Congress, House of Representatives. Notice anything? This is a picture of all the United States presidents. This is the current United States Supreme Court. Now, let's bring it locally as well, because critical race theory can also apply, apply locally. This is the county board of commissioners of my county here in North Carolina. This is my governor. This is my police chief. This is my sheriff. This is my school board. You see where I'm going with this? White people run the systems in America. There's no judgment on this. It is what it is. So the rest of this big idea, the people who set up those structures and those systems naturally, by human nature, will tend to put their interests first. That's just the way we're wired. We tend to put our interests first. So here's the hard part. Therefore, the interests of the less powerful minorities in this culture will be subservient to the interests of the more powerful white elites who control the systems. You with me so far? Powerful white men largely are the people who have set up and run the systems. The interests of poorer minorities are going to be subservient to the interests of those people. That's where we start getting dicey with controversy. And here's big idea number three. We have to look at a problem from all angles to figure out how it became a problem. Only then can we solve the problem. Critical race theory takes a look at structural systemic racism from every conceivable angle to try to figure out how to undo it. So these are the two questions that critical race theorists are grappling with. How did we get to this point of racial subjugation within our systems? And how do we get to the point where we do not have racial subjugation in our systems? Here's where the major controversy comes in with critical race theory. This is where we start to get this muddied water of people thinking that critical race theory is something that it's not. Critical race theory is not about blame or guilt or individual prejudices or finger pointing. It is about acknowledging where we are. I want you to think of systemic racism kind of like an infected wound. This might be how a critical race theorist might describe it. This might be me imposing a theory on it, but bear with me. So if systemic racism is an infected wound, I need to open the wound. I need to drain it. I need to find the source of the infection. I need to deal with it. And then I can heal it. Somebody who is critical of critical race theory or what they think is critical race theory, is going to say there is no infection. So let's look at what the critics are saying. Criticism number one is that critical race theory is a divider, not a uniter. And the premise there is that if we face the root causes of racism, we cannot be united. 
Criticism number two, we need to quit dragging up the past. We need to leave it there so we can move on and heal. The premise there is that we no longer have systemic racism in America. So let's dig into that a little bit. What's going on here? I'm going to give you a few issues and we're going to take a look at some systemic problems. The median black household has less than 11% of the wealth of the median white household in America. We're talking about white and black people of the same gender and the same age with the same salary and the same education and the same number of children. Is this about habits or history? Shouldn't we find out? Black, American Indian, and Alaska Native women are two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women. Is this about genetics, lack of prenatal care, distrust of health care providers? Shouldn't we find out so we can turn this around? What's going on here? A 25-year-old black American man without a high school diploma is more likely to be institutionalized than employed. In 2010, 26% of this demographic was in jail, and 19% of the ones on the outside were unemployed. Doesn't this warrant some research on several levels? What's going on here? American Indian and Alaska Native students have a dropout rate twice the national average. Why? What's going on here? In several states, the Hispanic incarceration rate is four times that of whites. The ratio is most pronounced in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and New York. Why is that? So what we're talking about here could be issues with the banking industry, healthcare, education, and the criminal justice system. Criticism number three is that critical race theory is out to attack white people. And the premise here is that white people are being held responsible for the sins of their ancestors. Critical race theory is not about individuals. It is not about that woman's white privilege. It is not about what that woman thinks about another black woman. It is not about biases or prejudices of individual human beings. It is about the criminal justice system, housing programs, the education systems, health care, banking, mass incarceration. These are big issues. This is not about individual people. And this is where the rub really comes in with people thinking that critical race theory is about them. Of course, people are going to bristle if they think you're talking about them as individuals. That's not what critical race theory is. And criticism number four, critical race theory teaches children to hate America. The premise here, if we look at a factually accurate history of our country, we are being unpatriotic. Critical race theory is not taught to children. This is not part of any K-12 curricula. None. So let's talk about the outcry for a second. I have some theories here about why the outrage has become the outrage. I think part of it is just an ignorance of critical race theory. It's not what everybody thinks it is. Part of it is the use of critical race theory as a blanket term. Part of it is banking on others' ignorance of what critical race theory actually is. Part of it is that there are some factions that want to use it as a wedge issue. Part of it is just discomfort. If you're in a power position and somebody is challenging that power position, it's uncomfortable. There's a fear of change involved in that as well. Part of that discomfort and that fear of change is losing that power. And honestly, part of that outrage is racism. 
So let's go back to your anticipation question. How is critical race theory like Google Maps? If we're turned around, we have to know how we got here to know how to get to where we need to be. You guys, thanks for listening. If you want to know a little bit more about me, what I do, what I design, you can go to AngieCrosser.com. And I'd love to see you there.